So I'm Sean O'Sullivan, and I've been asked to give a brief response to the film we've just watched, Egress, by Mary Bred and Kevin O'Shanahan. And I think I wanted to begin by talking a little bit in the frame of reference that I drew up in my own essay for the catalog. And what I really want to say is that the difficulty and the pain that is highlighted in some of the documentary material that forms egress, it's just very powerfully affecting. It's, it's very strong and it's, in a lot of ways it's very hard to watch. Um, I think Alzheimer's disease, it, it's its own special kind of violence on the mind. It is a, it, it takes away something very special in a person. And what's so difficult about it is the inability to describe that experience for somebody who suffers it. It's just, to, for, for us to try to characterize that and see it from the outside is very, very difficult. And I think that's one of the really important things about this film, aesthetically speaking, because it's not trying to make some representation, and it's not trying to make a, a grand gesture in any sense. Instead, what you're seeing is just recollections and recordings and scenes and talking by people who have this disease who are just talking about how they feel. And that's a very significant thing, and actually it's a very hard thing to do because it is in its own way so emotional. It implicates so many people who, in their family life and their friendships have uh, relationships to people who suffer from this. And it requires a great amount of latitude in everybody's mind to try to understand what the feelings that are being expressed actually represent, what they, what they make up in their totality. That's, for me, is just what is so hard to watch. And it's actually a very sophisticated aesthetic thing that goes on in this film because between all of this difficulty that I've just described, there is some very beautiful and very expressive music that forms an interplay. And what, you, what you're seeing is just played off against the, you know, quite emotional, quite soft and quite moving movements of cello and violin that kind of rub up against each other, but they also push against the film and they change how what you're seeing and the words you're hearing, how they are all characterized, what that all means. Um, and without that, without that music, it's, it's almost too damning, it's almost too much, you know? I think it's very important to maybe try to get an understanding um, for, all, for all of us, I mean, in, in this conversation that we're going to have, to try to get an understanding of of maybe what the pain that we're seeing or what the, the difficulty that we're seeing means when you kind of, when you try to understand it against the context of art, when you try to understand it against the context of representing emotions, representing feelings, but also representing facts and, and ideas and people who are at the center of this. I wrote a little bit in the essay about my own grandfather and. Uh, how we had felt seeing him suffer uh, with Alzheimer's. This is about 10 years ago. And I, I must say, I found it really difficult to talk about. I really did. And the thing that really struck me, and I didn't want to write this, but I, I feel relatively free saying, about, saying it, is that there actually is nothing to say. It just... It's just there, and I, you know, in, in my in my memory, one of the kind of final times that we met, where he was lucid, he talked about uh, the the feeling of what it was like to have his eyes kind of failing him. They were they were closing a lot, and he couldn't he couldn't quite get his control over this, and it it stayed with me really. It stayed with me my, my entire life. He just said, this is the worst thing. There is, there is nothing like this. 
And that's really what's at stake in this artwork. That's, that is the kind of thing that you're talking about. There was, a, there was another version, an earlier version, that I think was shown at West Cork Art Centre, where a man talked about his experience of being able to travel to London when he was younger and all the different things he was interested in and how that had kind of very slowly been taken out of his life and not, you know, he didn't, I, I was really struck by the fact that he didn't really want to set the blame or say why it had happened. He, it was just, it couldn't be done anymore. Going somewhere was, you know, that time was kind of over. And I don't mean to come off as saying that it's, a, it's a, an artwork that emphasizes any feeling of, uh, of hopelessness. I don't think that is, the, what is what is at play. I think what's happening is much more subtle. You're just hearing people talk. And that actually is a, that, that's quite powerful in its own way. Just, just, just hearing them talk about what the, what the sense of this is and um, how it makes itself manifest, what they feel. And I guess a lot of people had the reaction that it was quite distressing to, to do that, you know. Um, but talking in its own way is, is it's very, it's very powerful. It, um, it just makes concrete some things that really we have extraordinarily, di extraordinarily difficult times navigating. Um, and particularly, it's, a, it's particularly important when you feel like you've been shut out of being able to understand your own feelings around this illness. And I know definitely if you're somebody who has uh, seen Alzheimer's in your own family, one of the feelings that really takes over is that the most important person is the person who's suffering, and that's true. But you get to thinking so much that this is the case, that you sort of stop being able to make interpretations of it yourself. You stop being able to kind of describe your own feelings. That was one of the other things that I thought was very powerful uh, in the, the documents that led up to the production of this film was a, a, a daughter talking about her mother and just saying that she might tell a story and think that this was a very, uh, you know, a good story, a normal story, just the kind of conversation that anybody would have and then tell it again and tell it again and tell it again and this might happen ten times. Um, I remember that very distinctly. It's, it's, uh, it is, <laughs> I don't know, you, you, you know, you, you feel like you're being very patient, but you're not quite sure where the realization sits with the person who's telling it. Do they know they've told it before? Do they have a vague recollection of having maybe mentioned it, but they can't remember? And there's a certain politeness that almost becomes unethical around it. Um, you know, you try to not push people too hard, you can end up treating them like they don't deserve to even be interacted with. That's, that's very difficult, and I think that's really brought up in, in this film, um, particularly around the way that Marie and Kevin worked, where there is this very direct approach of just going and, and discussing things. Just discussing and just recording that and, and having that be the, uh, the form of work that is, the, I guess, the most aesthetically appropriate, the most conceptually rigorous, the most good and right way of documenting this. And it's very, very powerful for that, and I think it has a certain kind of strength for that. And uh, I must say, I really applaud them for that. Um, so that's what I'm gonna say for the moment. Thank you very much.
Um, hello everyone, my name is Anne O'Connor, as um, Anne was saying, and I'm just going to chair the panel discussion uh, part of the evening. Thank you so much, Sean, for an artistic and very personal response to the work, and I think really highlighting how hard it is to express the unexpressible, the wordless, in ways that maybe only the work can do. Um, that language fails us sometimes. Um, so I, we have a wealth of experience in the room, um, and I think we have arts perspectives, health professionals, educators, artists, and perhaps, uh, I think, family, friends, participants here. So I will just introduce the panel, and then I, we will uh, begin with Mark, but I might just say who's here first, if that's okay, Mark. The other thing I suppose I will say, as you can see, we are recording. Um, so uh, the purpose of the recording is really to capture uh, the key themes and what, what's been said today. But if anybody is uncomfortable about the recording or would like um, maybe to talk to us at the end to say if there was anything you, you said that you wouldn't like, would you would like edited out, then... That's absolutely fine, Marie, yeah? So maybe you could talk to me or, or any of us, really, and we'll pass that on. Um, okay, so we have Dr. Mark Turl, uh, who we will call Mark from, from this point on, and he's uh, <laughs> Director of Undergraduate Education at the Catherine Macaulay School of Nursing and Midwifery at UCC, and he is also a Registered General and Psychiatric Nurse, and a musician, I just found out. Um, so Joe, we have Joe Callanan, who's the Outreach Day Nurse Coordinator with the uh, Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, and I don't know if you're a musician or your artistic yeah. bent. Um, and Joe has been key in, in not only the egress project, but also uh, in the Converging Lives project, uh, which preceded this project um, and happened in 2012, funded through a Create Artists in the Community Scheme Award. Um, and that was just in Bandon, wasn't it? That, yeah, that project. Um, so we have John Hinchcliffe, and John is service manager uh, in Cork with the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, and he's based out in Besborough Daycare Centre in Blackrock. And John John has also been key. key. Were you involved in the uh, Converging Lives project as well, John? Or was it predominantly yeah, egress? Yeah, yeah. Sort of <laughs> okay, great. In a developmental role. Um, we also then, as you know, we've heard from Sean, um, who is a writer and curator, Sean O'Sullivan, and we have the stars of the evening, Marie Brett and Kevin O'Shanahan, visual artists and musician who have worked together now for two years, potentially collaborating cross art form and of course collaborating cross sector with the health sector and perhaps the community sector in a way also. So um, we also have in the room, everybody here is an expert. Um, so there are other members of the advisory group who, who uh, informed and, and supported the Egress project, and that includes Maeve Deneen, for, uh, Community Arts Coordinator with Cork City Council, Justine Foster, Education and Community Coordinator at West Cork Arts Centre, where the Egress work was um, on show and in July and August of this year, and Aidan Warner from the HSE Cork Arts and Health Programme, and uh, Julie Murphy, who's a witness writer. And maybe just to give a shout out to there are four pieces written for the Egress catalogue um, from Sheila Broderick, Sean, Marie, Kevin, Julie, um, and who am I forgetting? Yay, okay. Um, so I think now I'm going to hand this over to Mark. You'll be delighted that I stop talking, and then we will just open it out to the floor, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank Thanks. You, Mark. Uh, thanks very much, Anne. And as Anne said, I'm a bit of a musician, and normally when you hand me a microphone, I sing. Uh, and if I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I'd be more comfortable singing because I'm not an artist. Uh, even though I have a little bit from my professional background, I'll say a small bit about it, a little bit of insight, I suppose, into uh, visual arts. But before I start, I suppose, again, congratulations um, to Marie and to Kevin on this wonder wonderful piece of work. I feel they've managed to capture. I've been uh, a nurse for 33 years, and I've been teaching and researching for 20 years, uh, specifically in the field of dementia. And I feel in a, a short clip of 11 odd minutes that you've managed to capture you know, some of the essences of the challenges, the losses associated with dementia. And I'll say a small little bit about that. Um, 
You heard my background. Uh, I've been a nurse for 33 years, um, not from Cork, but I trained in Cork and I've been teaching for about 20 years. I also do a fair bit of work with John and Joe and colleagues, Vanessa's in the audience and others not here present uh, with the Alzheimer's Society because my particular area of research and interest is um, family carers. Uh, I did my PhD on family carers and um, a particular intervention which I won't bore you with here but there are some resonances between the intervention and some of the themes that I gleaned from both the presentation and the essays here. Um, I, I saw the piece for the first time just two days ago and I looked at it again earlier today in the office and I saw it of course here in the public um, display. I have to say when I looked at it first it was at home and it was on my own VCR and it was on my own actually and the kids were out, my wife was out and it was a dark evening like this and I actually found myself struggling at the end trying to maintain some hope uh, and I, I hope you don't take that negatively, I will dig myself out of that hole in a moment. Normally I'm an optimistic sort of a person and the particular research I do um, involves a series of workshops and some here present would know those. And while it doesn't give a false hope of a ma magic cure for dementia, it gives a different perspective on the world of the person with dementia. It's called the progressively lowered stress threshold model. And I won't bore you with it, but it's actually a very, very simple concept. And it does actually allow family carers to exercise some control over understanding the world of the person they love and they care for and why you know they behave such and we see, we've seen some of the iconographies here but I did struggle it was a very I had a whole series of strong emotions you know over my 30 odd years as both a clinical nurse and as a teacher and I continue to meet people with dementia in my clinical work and through my research and their carers you know I, I I've seen a lot of this imagery uh, but I did find it difficult that evening, sitting at home, in, in this, you know, a dark evening and watching it on the VCR at home. I felt there was some very, very strong, not just the imagery, but also the juxtaposition of the words. And really, I wrote a few notes here, I wrote a few pages actually, but uh, I wrote a few words here. And my very first thing was that the opening song and the image for me captured it all. And really for me, the essence of that, you know, was, that, you know, I, I, I expect a day, but I met night or something, and I went out through the door backwards. It was all about the, the mixed up world of the person with dementia. And, you know, I know as an academic, I suppose, and a healthcare professional, this is the world. You know, their failing cognition, their failing ability to perceive. We take so much for granted, all of us present here, about what's going on. You know, we have the sights, we have the sounds, we have the tastes, we have the smells of the nice canapes earlier on. And our brain can coordinate all of that so readily together. And we can screen out all the stuff that isn't relevant, like there was a, a, a siren of some shape or form went on outside, but most of us didn't go looking out the window. But maybe the people in the video, if they were here present, would have gone to look out the window because their brain can't screen out what's going on out there. So I felt, you know, for a short clip, it captured some of those essences, forgetting somebody's name and the consequences, I'd say a bit on it. Uh, looking at an image in the mirror, and my guess is because I've met many, many pa patients before, and I know Doreen is an expert in the field as well, and I feel confident you'd agree, many people with dementia don't recognize that self in the mirror because their short-term memory is gone. If you show them a picture of themselves when they were 16, like they did to Ronald Reagan, the late Ronald Reagan, he remembered himself at 16, he said he was a lifeguard. Not even Nancy Reagan or his children knew that because they didn't know him when he was 16. So, you know, seeing oneself in the mirror, you're not recognizing the reflection. And in particular, the second clip towards the end, the lady speaking to the person in the, in the mirror. And I, for me, that was very poignant. And I did find it difficult, actually, to watch that because... On, on a simple level, yeah, she didn't recognize herself in the mirror. She felt she was talking to somebody else. But yet she saw the, that somebody else was upset. What's wrong with you, she kept saying. And we know this from working with people with dementia, that you know, sometimes the spoken word, it takes them too long to process what they're hearing. And it may take a long time to make sense out of the, the question or the sentence we put to them. But a lot, of, a lot of what's in our long-term memory has been imprinted there from the time we were pre-verbal, the time we were children, do you follow? So the neural circuitry, the cells that are laid down in circuits in our brain are more intact. So we know that people with dementia often will recognize non-verbal cues. So it's, it's quite possible that that lady recognized, didn't recognize this was herself, but recognized that this was somebody who was upset or something was troubling them. She kept saying, what's wrong with you? There's something wrong with you. And that's one of the things uh, I took from it. Uh, I, I know there are more speakers, so I, I'll bring in some other bits maybe when the discussion opens up, but just a couple of more points. Um, 
you know, the, the frustration and the embarrassment, even I would say, I, f I sensed even an embarrassment among that man, who was that singer, what's this his name was, and, you know, frustrated about it, and I, he even said he was anxious, and they don't take me out anymore since I became sick, and I felt that was quite sad. So, really, I suppose, at the end of it, I did feel, I had a sense of despair and hopelessness, but then I, I pulled myself back from that, because I, I know from my professional work and the work of people like Tom Kitwood, the work of people like Buck Walter and Hall, again, some of the academics and healthcare professionals in the audience will know that. These are people who, yes, they accept that there is a biological basis to dementia, and that essentially, whichever of the 103 types of dementia you have, essentially what's happening is your brain is gradually dying, eroding away in varying sequences. Uh, but nevertheless, we've noticed for about 30 years, how is it though that some people who have X amount of dementia, a big lot of dementia, when you look at a scan, for example, even though scans aren't the best, I know Dorian will tell me that, but how come people who have a lot of dementia, to use a simple term, are yet functioning at a fairly high level? And yet other people who have a small amount of dementia, and therefore you might expect the functioning at a better level are functioning quite poorly. And people like the late Tom Kitwood, people like Buck Walter and Hall and others have hypothesized therefore there has to be something else. And the something else is the environment, a key component of which is dignity, respect and the according of personhood. And you know, I also want to con congratulate the essayists here because, again, they've captured a lot of it. And Judy, uh, we had a conversation with you earlier on, um, you know, about I like the idea of collaboration because that fits very much with my personal philosophy, both as a nurse and as, as a teacher. Not doing to, you know, not the researcher researching the subject or not the teacher teaching the student or not the nurse or the doctor telling the patient this is the best medicine. Modern practice in all those realms would really be about collaboration, working with people. And Doreen, we collaborated on a project down in Clonakilty some years ago, and even though we felt it would be a challenge, in addition to interviewing nurses and care staff and also family members, we decided on a point of principle, we would also interview the people with dementia. Even though we didn't get a lot of usable data back for that study, nevertheless, we felt that was according them personhood and that was according them some, some, some sense of dignity. Because we must be aware that people with dementia get a sense of failing. They get a lot of no messages in the world, you are wrong messages. I don't mean people actually say those words, but the, the subtle messages they got. There was that man failing. What was that singer's name? Do you follow? It would be a bit, a bit like me, you know, forgetting Don Henley's name out of the Eagles, and I'd sometimes murder a song or two of his. Do you follow? It would be a bit like my kids forgetting Shane What's-His-Name out of Westlife. Do you follow? So, you know... It, that's a message to him, he is failing. He's no longer able to remember something that was important to him. The lady wandering around the corridor. So there's a lot of negativity and a lot of failure. So really, you know, anything that will enhance and bolster and protect the self-respect, the dignity and the personhood of that person with dementia. They are still an adult, but they are struggling to operate as an adult in our world, yeah? So I, I won't say anything more. A very strong uh, message for me there, a very strong set of imagery, both the visual and the, 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 the very clever choice of, of the, the words, particularly the opening song or piece of poetry, and then, of course, hearing what the people themselves uh, with dementia had to say. I, my students would know I could go on and on and on, but I better not, because there are more people to speak, so. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so, I think we might, um, I know there are questions. I know there are people with questions in the audience. I know there are people here who have plenty to say also. So I'm thinking I might just go straight to questions because we could talk among ourselves and next thing you know it will be 7.30 and nobody has said anything. So we'll fill in the gaps. There might be questions that are very practical about the background to the project or the running of the project or how the artists might have collaborated together. So th that's very welcome. Hi, um, Maeve Deneen from Cork City Council. Um, I have a question uh, for uh, John and Marie and Kevin. Um, I think Marie and Kevin were really clear in what they wanted to undertake with egress in that uh, they wanted to explore new ways of working in this context, but also they wanted to create a new artwork. And I'm just wondering, did you um, have many challenges in kind of ensuring that centrality of the artwork as part of the project? giving the sensitive context that it's in. Thanks, Maeve. Yeah, well, um, I suppose we mentioned earlier, it's very important to remember this work grew out of the Con Converging Lives project. 
And I suppose reflecting back on um, when we started the work again, I think there was an awful lot of groundwork done. We, we had set out a lot of uh, that work from working particularly closely with Joe and John also, as he mentioned there in Bandon. Um, certainly we seemed to start, when we started on egress, uh, in general things seemed to move quite smoothly. I will say at the very start that we had a very tough meeting actually, our initial first meeting back, where we in some ways maybe trashed out some of those concerns. And again, we mentioned earlier just the, uh, obviously with the, the um, there's different interests within our advisory group uh, to try and balance the different interests around the table. So in hindsight, starting off in January last year, it was, uh, we had quite a tough meeting at the start of really trying to work out what was possible here, the ethical challenges, how could we work, uh, how could this be done preserving people's dignity. But I think having had a very honest meeting at the start, it seemed to help us move on then. Uh, after that. So in ways I would say for egress we seem to be, the, the artwork from the very start was always central whereas in the earlier project in Bandon with Convergent Lives I think there was more uh, negotiation that had to happen and it's probably in some ways a model for many of these projects. I'm involved in a, a project at the minute that's actually started at that very early stage and I was just aware during the week how much you forget sometimes at the beginning how much negotiation has to happen. And, and the different expectations from everyone around the table and finding a way again to bring them together, so. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think there are, there are two quick things to say. The, f the first one is that um, in, in the case of the converging lives, um, we fairly rapidly thrashed out what our parameters were. And because of that, and because of the success of converging lives, it's safe to say that Joe and I uh, had confidence in Kevin and Marie, or Marie and Kevin, which of you? And um, because of that, we were able to take the proposal that we had been a party to, to the families and to the clients of ours who, who participated. Um, it, it's safe to say there's considerably more people involved in, the, in the, the piece than you actually could identify from that. I mean, I'm, I'm in the fortunate position of knowing all of them. Um, and without that level of confidence, I think it would have been impossible to bring this to you tonight and, and um, because it's necessary to, to convince the people who are actually um, reflected in the work that this is worth doing and it's worth doing in a way that I think is on the one hand risky, edgy, I find it disquieting to watch it and I've seen it many times um, but is also in, in my personal and professional opinion extremely worthwhile. Um, you, you talk, you, you, I'm assuming from what you said John that the families, so the individuals and their families were very involved in the process. So did that mean that there was a process, I suppose it's to Marie and Kevin as well, it, it, in the process was there moments when you lost things? You know, when you said an artwork was central, that you had to forego things that you, as, an, as artists, would have wanted to hold on to. Want to address that? Um, I think that's a really good question. I think it's a challenge that particularly Kevin and myself, found that I suppose, in honesty, we've got about five works, really, and we wanted to commit to one that would be as strong as it could as one. And I think that's where it worked well as a collaboration, that we didn't fight, but we pulled in different directions. So at the point when we'd collected, as John alluded to there, a lot of material and then subsequently had to let go of a lot of material for the, for the centrality of the work. Um, it, was, it was very hard, and I think something that benefited us was time. And we had two people, informally three people, who critiqued the work, as well as then the advisory group. So in terms of things, we had to let go of a lot, physically, in terms of materials, and I think also we had to negotiate 
between the two of us and then between the, the advisory group, the priorities of some aspects of the work, which was, which was healthy for the work, I think. Um, and you only asked when you say you have to let go, have you erased footage? Is, is it to that degree that you've let go work? We haven't physically 100% um, binned it. We've put it off in a very far place. I don't know whether we'll revisit it. It's not deleted, but it couldn't make it into this work. And then it's a very kind of poignant question is, if it has a life beyond this work, what is the life of that to be? How relevant is that? And what does it then do in relation to this work? So we're not at that stage to make that decision, really. We haven't, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't binned it. Um, but I don't know if it'll ever surface. Um, I have a question that, that uh, my name is Catherine Atkinson and I work with CREATE um, that relates to um, representation and artwork I suppose um, that part of me when I first saw the work had an expectation that there would be some potentially some anonymity around the individual people um, in relation to the area of dementia because of some experience I'd had in the context of mental health, where sometimes those agreements can be made or not made in relation to representation. But I was also interested in relation to um, the challenge of showing an artwork that is collaborative with so many uh, partners and people and expectations. Um, and what that means for both the artists and the partners about showing that artwork in relation to representation of this particular experience of dementia. The people who really work very closely with the area of dementia, but also from an artist's point of view, I think it's really challenging that question of dementia, uh, sorry, that question of representation um, sometimes when making work and how it's perceived. So just, just in response to the first part of that question, um, the, the, the thing about anonymity, um, all the people who took part either in their own right, if they had that capacity, or through their next of kin or, or close family, um, agreed to take part in the work. Um, and that for us is quite, as a society, is quite interesting because we very, very infrequently photograph people. We've got lots of lovely photographs of our buildings and we've got lots of lovely photographs of people doing hand massage and the backs of people's heads and things, but we very, very rarely will you come across a photograph that you can distinguish as being one of our clients. Um, but it was made clear um, to the participants that, there, that they would appear in this work in some way. There were actually some people who, who declined um, or maybe they weren't, maybe I can't, I'm, I'm trying desperately to think of anybody who actually said no at this stage. Um, we, we've not left people's surnames in, in the credits um, and that was because some people asked to have the surnames left out so it was easier to leave out everybody's than, than to have a, some sort of hierarchy of, of, uh, of, of participation. But essentially we, we went to everybody and, and it was clear to them that, you know, um, anonymity was an option, but it would also therefore obviously exclude your face appearing on the screen. Um, yeah, just to say, I suppose, Catherine as well, um, again, we couldn't have done this project without an advisory group. So at the start, that was very, this was obviously a very important issue, I suppose. Marie and I were very clear at the start again that this was going to be an artwork representing it's our response from, from a number of months, really. And that, I suppose, 
in the initial process of putting the work together, we couldn't be thinking too much down the line around every single decision around consent. So what we did do was we put a draft of the work together that we felt was a representative work. We brought that to an advisory group then. And in, in that way, um, that, that, I suppose that was our strategy really for the evening with, with those issues. I think just something to, to kind of follow on a little bit. Um, for me, it was really important that we were together, all of us working with real people. And there was nothing, in, in my small opinion, that was shameful or embarrassing or something that couldn't be explored positively and creatively, working with other people. So I, right from the onset, was very keen for, with what everyone's alluding to, all the ethical considerations, it to be visually people that are living their lives like we all are every day. Um, I think... Um, I have big challenges in terms of people's, n not people's full names been in the work, but I accept that it's part of a collaboration, but I have massive challenges myself with that because I'd be looking for full representation in terms of people's full names. And as Kevin said, I suppose um, a practical, tactical tool we used was to, to put a, a draft of the work together so people could get a sense of, um, in terms of the, the portrait photographs, using um, a lot of shadow and mirroring um, as a symbolic tool, people could get a real physical sense of what that looked like because it isn't the same as traditional portraiture. So, but for me, it was very important that it was honest and authentic and of the moment and real. I, might, uh, I thought I might just say something that struck me as well because it's a very interesting question. It brings up one of the really... Um, one of the, probably one of the most potent parts of the work, which is the question of identity. And I think when you, when you really look at what's happening inside the work, it is talking about uh, how people see themselves, how they, how they imagine their experiences. So I think definitely Marie and Kevin would have had to contend with those very difficult ethical questions about uh, is somebody anonymous or are they not? But I think you'd really have to also consider, and this is quite important, that creating anonymity in this work would by itself be a reduction of identity, which is so important to it, you know? So it's, it, it does bring up something that's quite tense in the work, and I just wanted to put that in there. Just briefly, in, in the research field, the same sort of issue arises, you know, um, in principle, and I alluded to it earlier, people like me would wish to include people who have dementia in research so that they have a voice. But at the same time, you've got to convince an ethics committee that's a good thing to do uh, because they're also seen as vulnerable subjects. So, you know, it depends very much on the agency who holds the control over the ethical decision making. And in a recent study, and Doreen was involved in this as well, in addition to that ethical issue, we also wanted to uh, put pictures in because it, I won't go into the study, but, you know, the, you needed to have visual imagery as well of the environment. We ended up having to pixelate the pictures and it didn't really, really... You know, in, with hindsight, it probably would have been better off not to use them at all. That's my view. But it, it is an issue arises in research as well. People like me would have to argue the point that it's giving a person with dementia a voice, a presence in research, some sort of a say, but at the same time, they're vulnerable subjects, and that has to be obviously considered. Yeah. The fact that quite a few people were disturbed, or whatever words you want to use when they were looking at the imagery, is it because they actually could see people's faces? That you actually, you know, came face to face with someone with dementia? You know, as opposed to, as you said, looking at the back of someone's head, looking at someone's hand painting, that you actually saw <coughs> fear or the way someone has, is approaching how they feel about things, that you actually saw the person. You know, it's, it's, it's such a shock for some people to actually come face to face with someone. You know, it's very easy to read a report and be shocked and upset, but when you actually see it visually, when you see people talking and you see people forgetting the words for something and hear them speaking it, is, you know, I'm just wondering, does that make, make it extra something else? So the, the immediacy of the work mm. the, and the impact of the yeah, work. I'm just wondering, you know, yeah. people looking at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Does anyone have a, a particular response to that? Maybe, um, I just feel that if you don't, you don't reach into the subjective reality of the person, if you can't see the person, it's like anonymity, really. Like, you know, that... Um, you have to uh, see an object 
not calling a person an object, but it's just the reality, reaching into the subjective reality of the person. The person is a very important factor in this uh, project, I felt, you know, that um, you were connecting at a very deep level with the person, and the artist had the opportunity of that also, which I am in a privileged position each Monday and Friday to connect with them. But for the artist, it was a different theme because I coordinate programs on Monday and Friday in outreach services. So therefore, I felt really, you know, that uh, if you can't see the person, what are you hiding? Because yeah, I, wor I work with people with dementia every day. Yeah. It's my job. Um, and I'm an artist as well, so it's just a, it's a combination yeah. of things. I just, yeah. I just feel when you're, you're so involved all the time. It's mm. when, when I bring people, when I bring residents with me to an outing or, you know, when you're out mm. viewing. Um, we've, I work with um, collaboration with KCORD and we've got a special um, program called Vision, which is based on Meet Me at Mama. And we bring people to a gallery to discuss art. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's just a fantastic experience. It's a great experience because I. But the reaction I actually also. from everybody else is just amazing. Mm. From from onlookers at it, mm. that that to me was just another aspect I didn't expect to be mm. so big. But it really is such a big part mm. of it. Mm. Um, we'll we'll take further questions. So there on the on the third row. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Russell, an, an artist um, based in West Cork, working for the West Cork Arts Centre. I just wanted to ask Marie and Kevin, in your uh, work collaboratively, um, how did that work practically? Um, because did you work with the um, participants directly together? And then how did you kind of um, pr progress the work on from there? How did that come together? Okay. Um. It, it took many different shapes. I think the, um, the first phase, the first project, Converging Lives, we did quite a lot of work over... <laughs> Joe wants to say something. Over in Bandon um, together. Um, we, in our disciplines, we work very differently. I often work very solitary, one-to-one, -one, and Kevin inherently works as a, a bigger group often. Um, but in terms of the production of the work and in terms of connecting and engaging with people, we often work together. Whereas um, now, both in Besborough and Middleton, we <coughs> were always present together on the same day, but didn't work together that often physically in the room. We worked with different people in adjoining rooms. I think it was fantastic because both premises allowed for that. We were kind of occupying two or three rooms at a time. Um, so the actual engagement predominantly was with individuals and we were seeking to connect in a moment with people, quite often with a member of staff, sometimes not, um, in under the wing of the staff, if that makes sense. Um, we spent a lot of time then afterwards talking <laughs> an awful lot and looking and talking and looking and talking and looking and listening, I should say. So, uh, like Marie said, yeah, I suppose, again, our different mediums and ways of working. Um, we were looking again in the spaces that we could work. We had, we were in the position uh, to work individually, come back again to Convergent Lives. Uh, being here now and just talking as we are this evening, you realize again how much we actually learnt during that whole first project. I think a recurring theme for us ourselves was the importance of being comfortable yourself in the situations. We learned very quick that um, if, you were, if we were too concerned with the work or trying to capture material, or if that became too prominent in our thinking, uh, just uh, things just did not work. We, we learned that really, um, ourselves that you had to be quite comfortable and quite um, almost allow room for interactions to emerge really. So we worked solo, we would have said I suppose with, with different individuals. Um, I, we were very lucky again in, in the spaces in that after working with people we did have the opportunity to sit down then. So we didn't just work individually and then go our, off our separate ways. We had 
opportunities each day after working individually to talk with staff, talk ourselves, and just start to get a very um, rough picture of where this might be going. And then as we progressed towards the drafts of work, then we worked quite closely uh, together around the editing. And as Marie mentioned, we had a lot of discussion and you know different opinions. Um, and towards the final draft, it was very beneficial then having, we had a really intense um, week or 10 days of really having the time with the work. And that was really valuable then. So in the, in the real, uh, the final stages that he added in there. Just one other thing. Just one other thing to say. We were kind of aware of what each other were doing, if that makes sense. So Kevin might be having a conversation, and I'm thinking of in in Middleton. Kevin might have been having a, um, a conversation with someone and recording that, and then in another room there'd be the most fantastic, beautiful, delicate singing happening that we didn't know was going to happen, and that Joe was leading. And then I'd be kind of going like this and Kevin would yeah. connect instantly and go out and then look to record that and similarly somebody would mention something to Kevin that had really connected with that person and he'd mention that to me and then I'd try and bring that conversation up to capture that connection visually if that makes sense so we were although we were working separately we weren't really but we weren't physically in the space together. Just very practical did you did you both were you both behind the video camera? A film camera, well, and that's one question. Uh, or was it set up like a fly in the wall, or did you anticipate things that were going to happen and follow the action? Yeah. I'll just talk about the audio recording. I suppose no, we purposely uh, used audio equipment that's very minimalistic, really. That's not intrusive at all, really. Small handheld recorders, really, because it's a very good point again. Yeah. The, uh, you, you couldn't, in the rooms again, um, the more obtrusive the equipment is, the more you're getting in the way of, of the interactions, all right. Yeah, I suppose um, I changed. When I worked um, with, with Joe and John at the beginning in the first project, um, I just used um, a handheld camera and at times used a tripod. Um, and I wasn't mad happy doing that myself in terms of the aesthetics of the work, but I felt like Kevin saying that was really necessary in terms of the equipment didn't get in the way. But when we made the decision to go on and do the second project, I really felt I had to step it up and just see if I brought in big lights, what would happen? Because I knew for the aesthetic of the photography, um, it would really help. Um, so we just tried, didn't we? And I brought in these huge lights and we were in a separate room. And I think it's... What, what Joe and John touched on, there was, there was a kind of trust inherently in the space. So when I was photographing people, we kind of got past the lights and the equipment and everything kind of quite quickly. Um, and if we didn't, I'd have had to have gone back and, and use, use the equipment differently. And did you ever show any of that footage to the people you were filming? Yeah, with the photography, I always showed people ongoing, but it was only on the camera itself. Um, and then at points um, when I was doing projection work, I had it on a small laptop. So it was, it was through discussion. It wasn't formally done. It was just done in the nature of, and now this is what this looks like. And then we'd go back and have more conversation and take more photographs. And then we'd go back and look at it. So, yeah, it was an inherent part for me. My name is Mary, I'm a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Society and a PhD student in the psychology department in UCC. Um, just kind of questions kind of about the process and so on. I know, you know, we're talking about identity and that kind of loss of self and trying to hold on to that and kind of instill that, I suppose, empowerment in that situation. I'm just curious, was there any um, situations where kind of the power was taken off you for all the world as in you went in with an idea in your head and the people actually went, no, we're doing it this way. So was there any part of it that was on their terms that you weren't expecting, you know, that they took direction of the whole thing? Um, and the second question, just in relation to, I suppose, like, family, I mean, these, these people, this is their daily lives, but all of a sudden if someone catches that daily life and puts it in a frame, it has that kind of effect of, whoa, making them think more about it. And I was just curious that any families maybe come back and talk to you a bit more about it, or the reaction they had to actually seeing it in a different view. Thanks, Mary. Um, the second part first, uh, only 
on Monday this week, we were in a group with the people from Middleton and we were having a conversation about family members who had come here and seen the piece. And so direct family were telling us what the extended family thought about seeing. So yes, that's happened and ongoing. In terms of people directing themselves or directing Kevin and um, Marie, then yes, I think that happened on numerous occasions that Kevin and Marie came with an idea to do one thing and ended up doing something slightly different because people wasn't, didn't want to sing Danny Boy or did want to sing Danny Boy or, or whatever it was. But I, I think a point which sort of touches on what you were saying about the fly on the wall thing, for me, the, the absolutely powerful image that I will keep with me until I've stopped keeping images um, about these things it is the image of the lady talking to herself in the mirror. Um, now, if you'd shown me that and told me that that was an actress, then I wouldn't have been a bit surprised. I, I think the way that was captured, um, which Marie might like to talk about because that was... The, the family did say this is something that you should you should see. I think that's one of the most truly powerful images um, that I've come across in, in the context of dementia, because that's clearly somebody, as as Mark said, who does not recognise that they are talking to themselves and does not recognise the self in the mirror, but but does understand that there is there is something troubling that that stranger. I, I think that's. I just think that's a fabulous image to actually catch the reality of, rather than staging it, and staging it with an actress, um, and to actually manage not to get caught in the mirror or the camera caught in the mirror. I think is a, is a fabulous piece of work. Yeah. So just a question for John and Joe. I'm just interested in hearing um, how this project and the previous projects have impacted on the Alzheimer's Society as an organisation terms of the, the workers and the centres and whether you feel this work through the involvement in these recent projects will be embedded in your ongoing work uh, as part of your care programme. I suppose especially in the context of I suppose you know difficulties around resources and um, I suppose other competing interventions that are possible. Well to answer that really Aidan I suppose it brought about a personal connection in the moment for us with our clients, which was very important, it released anger and rage, you know, anxiety. And that was a major, uh, I suppose, health benefit in the fact that everyone was relaxed and uh, enjoyed the moment, particularly the um, music and the interaction with the artists was very close and somebody different raising their self-esteem was very important factors in both uh, projects that were done. This project is very different, as you're aware of, uh, as opposed to the Converging Lives. And I suppose I can relate to the Converging Lives. The evaluation that was done on that really was from um, the aspect of a family member showing that particular DVD as a legacy at uh, her her, the man that was involved in the project had passed on and the daughter showed the DVD at the wake and it was a great uh, source of comfort for the family uh, and she actually said it was a great uh, source of comfort in the grieving process. But as I said, that was a very different project to this particular one. So it was very... Um, I suppose the way this one is done is uh, going to be... Uh, a wait and see, and we have to, yeah, I suppose, speak with family members, and I think there's some family members even here tonight, and uh, their reaction from the first time they've seen it would be quite interesting, and uh, going forward, that will be done. Uh, on the other hand, um, we've already shown converging lives at our national conference um, last year, we have um, Converging Lives was entered into an international competition and, and um, didn't win first prize, but was uh, received a, a commendation. And since there were more things 
entered in the competition than there were commendations. It wasn't just sort of backhanded compliments. It was a genuine compliment to Kevin and Marie. Um, we would also, uh, certainly from the point of view of the staff, um, I, I think it highlights to people sometimes uh, what people are capable of as opposed to what we might think they're capable of or want them to be capable of so that we don't have to do anything more difficult than playing bingo or whatever. So, I mean, yes, definitely from that point of view, I think the fact that you highlight somebody's individuality is, is a very, very useful and, and powerful thing. And also, I, I, in all honesty, Aidan, as a teaching aide, just that image of the lady talking to herself in the mirror, I, you know, I patent, patent that quickly or, or copyright that quickly you know, before I steal it. Um, my name is Ruth and I'm, I'm a carer and I would just like to congratulate them. It's my first time seeing it and I think they've made a fantastic job of it and the one word that just comes to mind is powerful. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I have, Barbara Ann Harkin is my name. I have a very s small question, really, I, uh, on the practical side of things. Um, when you were engaging with individuals in one-on-one -on -one conversations, were there specific um, topics or issues that you explored with a number of different people, or were they kind of free-flowing conversations? Did you go in with questions that you wanted ans to ask people or get people's opinions on things? For me, it's a two-way deal. So I'd never perceived that I'd be interviewing someone I'd never in a million years dreamed to do that. So it was very much a free-flowing conversation. Um, and I would reveal things about myself like I would in with any conversation with someone else. So I was looking for a point of connection. And Kevin and myself sp spent a fair bit of time with Joe and John and other members of staff. I suppose um, observing and tuning in and also thinking what might be those points of, of magic, those points of connection. So <laughs> between us, we covered quite a lot of topics. Um, and I think um, someone alluded to it earlier, that sense or question of power in a room. And that's something I'm really interested in. And I don't want to hold power in a space because then, for me, magic isn't going to happen. It'll only happen when something, for me, that's unexpected comes into play. So. John mentioned it slightly there, often things, unexpected things happened. So we would have had, I suppose, little constellations of, of topics that we might have touched on, but often as not, it was for, for me and Kevin, it might be different, it was very much about who we, the two of us were as people. And it might be something about my father's job that, spur, that sparked, or it might be something someone was wearing it could be you know, so there was no formula at all um yeah i'd agree with that again um uh, with music often i would use songs to start with people that was one that the songs were almost like a way of establishing relationship just in that sense and finding out and i would agree with marie around the whole idea of the power i thought that was a very interesting question too because it certainly turned for me during uh, the project it, it, um, perceptions again that we might have of a person with dementia, whereas I have vivid memories of you know um, the tables being completely turned and learn, you know hearing about a different country and a, a way of that music is made where I was learning. So I was being I was the one actually asking the questions by the end of of some of the particular um, interactions, but there was. A, I suppose a loose structure, I wouldn't say interviews again either. Um, I think it was very important, well, for personally as well, I think I mentioned earlier, of allowing the space for people, that was really, and it's, it's, it could be difficult at times because um, sometimes to talk and to fill the silence is much easier. And sometimes some of the real magic happened when, when that silence was there. And I suppose we were always looking 
that's what we were really trying to do, those kind of authentic moments of expression, really, that didn't feel they were pulled or that they, that they emerged, really. So. Um, just one other little thing I'm forgetting to say is that um, Joe and John enabled, I suppose, a brokering with the families in terms of asking permission to use special objects or archive photographs and put a lot of work into that in terms of entrusting them into my possession for the moment in the, in the room with someone. And that was a great way of... Um, Having a special item that may or may not be remembered, that's something I'm very interested in. That was a very good start, and we, we worked a lot with that in the earlier projects. Do you want to talk a bit about that at all? Uh, yeah. Um, Joe, Joe just said, don't talk about that. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, we, we encouraged families to to bring in some sort of object, whether it was a photograph or a, or a physical thing, that, and they were very varied, um, which people could relate to. And it's interesting sometimes because something that might be interesting and I might think is a really great object, it transpires that the person has actually got no mass in anymore for, what, you know, for whatever reason. And sometimes I think we... we we project our own ideas onto our nearest and dearest. So we think this really, really important thing that I've got, for example, I have the most fabulous papier-mâché tortoise that my daughter bought for me as a Father's Day present. She thinks it's brilliant. I, I, <laughs> I have this brilliant Father's Day present of a papier-mâché tortoise, but I mean, 30 years from now, when, I, when Kevin and Marie are doing a film about me, I will have as much mass in that papier-mâché tortoise as I do today, kind of thing. You know, there are other things that are more important to me, and I think that, that's touched some. I, I do want to say that it's really such a privilege to witness all the expertise in the room, um, and I haven't had a chance to read the publication as fully as I'd like, but even what I've read particularly from Julie describing the process and the understanding of the practice, that that expertise, the value, the priorities placed upon the people who experience this as well as the artistic process is, is so... That what I mean about the expertise is I suddenly read about having two critics of the artwork as part of the process, and I wondered about that experience because um, it can guide, but it can also be, and uh, you can tend to be protective of work that's had so much investment from all the people that have been involved in the process to then invite critiques from external to that process can be quite a challenge, and I just wondered about that from, from the perspective of the artists. Um, yeah, the critiques were both... Um, of great help and a challenge at times. Uh, we, we certainly got some very good advice in a practical way, I think, that we would both openly acknowledge really helped towards, particularly towards the, uh, in the final weeks of the work. And it did come up in the final week where we did, for, from one of the critiques, around changing um, maybe something quite, that we felt was quite significant. And, um, that was difficult, and I suppose there was a trade-off to some extent in that. Um, but overall, I'd have to say, not I know it's almost a party line to say, but I would say the, crit the critiques we did, we were very fortunate with Pat Collins and Mel Mercier as well to have that level of expertise. And I suppose we really appreciated too uh, their honesty because there was honest, it, as we got closer towards the uh, screening at, in July um, and when the pressure is on and uh, we, there were suggestions as I say of how the work could, could have uh, benefited from, from the critique's point of view I suppose. Um, <clears throat> I'd agree. I think another thing that's important to say is that we had a really close collaborator with our editor Chris Cullen and so at the point when we were receiving critique 
and, and really welcoming it. And I think the work really needed it. Um, we would then have to negotiate where we stood with that, which we didn't always stand in the same place. And then we went back to Chris Cullen and said, we're thinking this. And again, he would then very gently be saying, why? So there were kind of layers of negotiation and layers of us individually and collaboratively having to reconsider changes, which I think is fundamental to the work. It's really, really important. I think as, as uh, Kevin is saying in a roundabout way, it's crucial you get the right person or people and it's crucial you have a really good editor to work with because you can just whiz off and the work can become something very, very different and you can be too close to it to actually make the call. Okay, sorry, so who has the authorship of the artwork? It's a really good question and it's down with Kevin and myself. It's a collaborative work, but fundamentally we took charge of being the authors of it. Is it a unique copy or are there? Yeah, that's another really good question. And I think it, it, it moves into as well what we were discussing, which was how do the families and the, you're moving on to that, how do we tackle that challenge in a way of making it accessible, but acknowledging that it is an artwork as well. Um, and we're, we're still working through that in terms of the amount of original copies and how we manage it. Um, we've worked through where it gets shown and how it gets shown and how it gets shared. Um, but um, in total honesty with you, we need to take advice um, in terms of the nature of the physicality of the work and additions and where they can be lodged and also safeguarding the work in terms of it being a in a digital um, file that could be lost. So, is there anything else you... Yeah, just to say, I suppose it, uh, it was a question that came up with, um, that we received advice from the, within the critiques as well about the importance of, of the work being shown to its best, really, and not uh, almost the dangers of work being devalued by just... Um, yeah, and it's a, it's a very difficult question again. And we will, we have a wrap up, like th this process goes on towards the end of evaluation meetings. There's still issues we are discussing and that's, that is one of the issues. Are all the people, I'll finish my question, are all the people still alive who are part of the piece? And the reason why I'm asking that is that uh, for families, I think the relationship shifts I'm speaking quite personally here from experience, shifts hugely when you go into this, you know, the, what people talk about the two stages of grief. Um, so in terms of like, if this was one of my loved ones in this, I would, you know, in terms of dealing with grief and loss, this is a very tangible evidence of something that people have to work through. And often people work through it in a very ephemeral way because the very nature of dementia and the way people are sh shut off from you, you tend not to document or photograph or even take notes of. So I think that's another challenge to this piece of work for, for you as well, and for everybody really, collectively. There are people who, there are, there are people who um, took part in the work, there are people whose images appear in the, in the booklet who are no longer with us, that's true. There are people that were in the project involved in it and they're not any longer with us. And you said you had a personal experience. How would you feel about the uh, project if you were, had a loved one involved?
and and yeah, as we said before, the previous artwork was actually used as a as part of the memorial at somebody's wake. So we we see merit in that as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's, a, it's an interesting point. So um, I will wrap up and then maybe we will have a final word from our panellists, if that's okay, because uh, we do have to leave the building or we'll be killed. Um, so maybe just, I suppose, it, we've raised as many questions as have been answered, I think, but it's just so interesting to look at the, uh, some of the, the key themes which were around collaboration and the nature of artistic collaboration between artists but also with the people they're working with, with staff, with participants. Um, and whose work is it? The artistic challenge, the artistic merit, the ownership and authorship and also the cycle of collaboration or the nature of collaboration and the creative tension that happens at the beginning and you know ongoing in a project, that tussle, the negotiation, the communication, and then uh, I suppose that understanding and language that has to be developed between partners um, before there can be a fluidity in a project. Um, and then the ethics and the consent and confidentiality issues. Um, and I think, most of all, I think what we were touching on there was around the personhood, identity, authenticity, authenticity the absence, the presence. Um, and it's, it's written, I think, in one of the press releases uh, or elsewhere, the person who remains behind the disease. Um, very much what the work is, is speaking to and the immediacy of the work that was mentioned. And I suppose to remind you, to see the work upstairs for those who happen, that it will uh, be here until the 9th of November, I think. And that Converging Lives was mentioned, which is a project that preceded this project that, that Marie and Kevin worked on together. Can that be seen online? Where would that be seen? I know you're... Is it... Artsandhealth.ie, which is, um, incidentally, that's good, reminding me to mention Artsandhealth.ie, which is a national website for arts and health initiatives that are happening all around the country. So you will find Converging Lives and other projects that um, people in this room have done, and also Marie and Kevin. Um, and so that is that. Maybe also just to mention, I did forget to mention Mel Mercier, who's the head of music in UCC, and he was a critical friend to the project, and Pat Collins, who's a filmmaker based in West Cork. Um, I know on behalf of uh, Marie and Kevin, they would like to thank all the funders, which were Cork City Council, Cork County Council, the HSE South Cork Arts and Health Programme, the Arts Council, and CREATE um, in, a, in an earlier project. And have I forgotten any of the funders? Okay, great. And the Crawford for hosting this event and the exhibition. Um, but before, I'd rather not leave it at that. I would like maybe just to put you on the spot and just get your instinctive and very short, but what will you take away, I guess, maybe from this conversation? Maybe it's something you've already said or maybe it's something you feel you haven't had the opportunity to say yet. So maybe just something very quick and we will leave it at that then. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Anne. Well, first of all, just again to congratulate you on a fabulous piece of work, and I'd agree with John there particularly because I was struck also by that last um, scene of the lady looking into the mirror. And I, I suppose there were challenges in there for me as an educator, especially in the booklet and the essays about, you know, the traditional approach in healthcare education was a bias towards the sciences and less towards the art. But I think there has, that has been, um, that, that imbalance is being addressed, certainly in UCC, in the College of Medicine and Health, Maureen O'Mahony, Dr. Maureen O'Mahony is here, and myself, for example, we um, teach in the area of visual teaching strategies. Uh, faculty staff from all of the schools of the College of Medicine and Health undertook training in the last two years using visual arts as a teaching mechanism for developing things like observational skills, critical skills, critical thinking skills, reflective skills, etc. And also we have introduced uh, an arts curriculum in our first year undergrad program as well. So we are, you know, I, I, I'm not an artist and a lot of the discussion and debate here was really about the art and I don't have a lot of aptitude in that area. But we're certainly interested in hearing uh, and being informed, you know, in terms of delivering our curricula and our education programmes. Uh, and, you know, certainly I will take back more ideas here, but just to be assured, we are on to it. We are offering modules uh, in our nursing BSc degree programmes and our medicine programmes, etc., that are really to do with the aesthetic and how that can uh, influence our practice and can, can be therapeutic with the people who are in our care. 
I suppose from my perspective, anything that raises the self-esteem and increases quality of life for the visitors to our centre and for the hours that they're with us and giving relief to the caregiver is, a, for me, a very important factor and, most importantly, the wonderful food we had here tonight in the gallery. Thank you. Um, I, 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 I think there's two things. One is anything that brings Alzheimer's disease and dementia into the mainstream um, I think is a good thing. I think the hiding it under the, the carpet and the only person who doesn't know they've got an illness is the person who's got it is, is a place that I, I, I prefer not to be. Um, the other thing that I would just say is if you haven't got a copy of the book, get a copy of the book and make sure you read the articles in that because the articles in that by Sean and especially I can see with a head down hiding the article by Julie Murphy is absolutely staggeringly good. No, no disrespect to anybody else, but yes, if you could make a note of that. Here. But if you've not got a copy of the book, make sure you get hold of one. Um, there are some about, I think, still aren't there? Um, and yeah, okay, thanks. There was a question earlier where we wondered Somebody wondered why it was so distressing to watch this film, why you get feelings of distress when you watch it. And I've been thinking about that since it was asked. And I think there's something quite strange that goes on. Maybe when you, when you meet somebody who uh, would suffer from Alzheimer's, you wouldn't imagine yourself uh, seeing them have that, having that. You'd see them as a whole person. And oddly enough, I think film is kind of a mental space or a sensory space. And I think the distress in some way of seeing these interviews and this is a very strange thing to say, but I hope you'll bear with me. When you see the interviews in this sensory mental space of film, not only do you see the whole person being interviewed, but you also see yourself. You know, and that, that I think is where the distress comes from. It's not just seeing the person, it's seeing, seeing you reflected back in it. That was one thing that had occurred to me. I wish I'd said it earlier, but thank you. <laughs> How to follow that. <laughs> um... I suppose for me it's about collaboration. I, I really embrace collaboration. Um, and it's about what, what I kind of learned was not to hold it too tightly, to have very clear intent, but to not hold the collaboration too tightly. That's kind of abstract, but I hope you get a sense of what I mean. Um, I, there's lots of things you could say again, but I suppose trust cuts across everything, really. I mean, Marie and I were very fortunate, genuinely. There was a lot of work went on behind the scenes in both Convergent Lives again and Egress, and without that trust with people, there was, a, and I, going right across the advisory group, families who invited us into homes, people, you know, a trust that we would try and create work of integrity to. And then just uh, to hear Mark saying as well, the idea of the trust between the sciences and the arts too, um, I think is hopefully something that can be developed. So great, thanks.